What's up everyone, and welcome to episode 22 of my State of Xbox series. This time, we're looking at the final developer under Bethesda's umbrella, and it's the Prime One, Bethesda Game Studios. Can their games going exclusive result in millions switching from PlayStation to Xbox? Are they even the best Bethesda developer despite being the main one? Let's find out. That's why we're here. Discover what's out there. Good luck, Constellation. You are go for launch. Bethesda Game Studios is a Maryland based developer that was technically established in 2001. Prior to this, these same developers were making the games you'd expect, like 1994's Elder Scrolls Arena. However, in 2001, their parent company ZeniMax Media decided to split publisher and developer responsibilities. Under the leadership of Todd Howard, Bethesda Game Studios would continue developing games under this new name, while Bethesda Softworks would focus on publishing games from all the developers that ZeniMax owns. I know, it's a little confusing, but it wouldn't be long before Bethesda Game Studios established themselves with their first game in 2002, The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. Development started once Elder Scrolls II released, but it was quickly decided that current technology was too weak to match their scope, and so was put on hold in 1997. Even once production started again a couple of games later, Morrowind still scrapped huge features like online multiplayer. Despite the reduced scale, BGS tripled their staff just to prevent Morrowind from being delayed too far out of its initial 2001 release date. It eventually released in May 2002 to an 89 on Metacritic, primarily for its open world and open-ended gameplay. It also sold well to match its critical success, as it was in the top 10 best-selling games on Xbox for a full year, an accomplishment shared only with Halo 1. However, it was technical issues that prevented Morrowind from reviewing higher. This broken code would unfortunately become synonymous with the developer. I was the kid, I was writing games when I was, you know, 12, whatever, and, uh, the other kids in the block would say, you know, I'm going to play quarterback for the Cowboys. And I'd be like, I'm going to make video games and everyone's going to play them. I'm like, you dork, go back to the chess club. Who's laughing now? <laughs> yes, I was in the chess club. Post Morrowind, BGS took a detour with IHRA Drag Racing 2005 before returning to the Elder Scrolls franchise with 2006's Oblivion. This time, the team opted for faster gameplay and fully voiced NPCs to differentiate the sequel. Additionally, in response to the simplistic NPCs Morrowind was criticised for, Oblivion used the Radiant AI system. This let NPCs make contextual choices to achieve their goals, rather than just complete scripted routines. For example, an NPC who wanted food might steal from others if given the opportunity and it was in their character. These improvements elevated Oblivion to a 94 Metacritic, and it even won Game of the Year at the 2006 Game Awards, as well as selling 9.5 million copies to match this monumental success. Though once again, criticism was primarily aimed at technical issues, as well as the infamous Horse Armor DLC. Despite Oblivion's ridiculous critical and commercial success, BGS shocked the industry with their next game, Fallout 3. This was because the Fallout franchise was not originally a Bethesda IP. In fact, Black Isle Studios, who developed Fallout 1 and 2, were at one point developing their own version of Fallout 3. Unfortunately for them, Interplay Entertainment went bankrupt and shut them down before it was completed. Fallout was then sold to Bethesda, who decided to rebuild Fallout 3 from scratch. This resulted in significant changes, like a switch to 3D graphics and real-time combat. When Fallout 3 released in 2008, it was met with universal acclaim for its open-ended design, choices that had real-world consequences, and excellent VO from the likes of Liam Neeson. However, its 91 Metacritic didn't quite match Oblivion due to VATS not being the most polished alternative to real-time combat, and it also launched with far more technical issues, many of which were game-breaking. It would still be Oblivion with over 12.5 million copies sold. 
Its five DLC packs were also considered some of the best ever, though GTA 4 also releasing in 2008 meant it had no chance at the Game Awards. What excites us in terms of what's going to have the biggest impact to you when you're playing the game and, and you're this character? So that's, you know, the main reason for first person is that, you know, t I want you to touch the world and, and, and make it feel real. And I, I just think the emotional impact of that is much greater. But then, I mean, you can really pull the camera back in third person and, and play it that way if you want to get a better sense of your surroundings. Um, so we've spent a lot of time on the third person over the shoulder stuff. But then VATS does allow you to, you know, I mean, as soon as someone shoots you, just go into VATS and what's the situation? And if you want to take care of it tactically in VATS, you can. And if you just want to use VATS just to check out what the situation is and then leave it and go run and gun the guys, if that's more fun for you, you know, so be it. Post Fallout 3, BGS went on to develop their most successful game, 2011 Skyrim. Like Oblivion, Skyrim utilized Radiant AI, but expanded it to allow further interaction between NPCs and the open world. These incremental improvements could be seen throughout Skyrim, which is why it also received a 94 Metacritic and Game of the Year. However, once again, Skyrim was plagued with technical issues, especially on consoles where limited RAM guaranteed crashes and low frame rates. BGS's building reputation for broken code didn't affect sales though, as Skyrim sold 30 million copies in five years. Then came a remaster for PS4 and Xbox One in 2016, a Switch port in 2017, Skyrim VR in 2018, a PS5 slash series version in 2021, and another Switch version in 2022. Yes, Skyrim has been memed for so many versions, but considering the game still sells millions of copies every year, a decade after launch, you can't blame Bethesda. The game's the game. But Skyrim would end up being the high point for a developer that was about to have a very significant fall. Now, Skyrim looks to the future, to its ultimate version. Alexa, play Skyrim. You're level 57 and see a tall snowy mountain. Climb it. Now, Skyrim and life become one. A mud crab scuttles towards First you. Roda. I didn't catch that. F First Roda! I didn't quite catch Absolute. that. First Roda! Your shout echoes all the way to Sovngarde. Skyrim, very special edition. Also coming soon to Etch-A-Sketch. Motorola Pagers. Oh, shit. And your Samsung Smart Refrigerator. Islam Noose. BGS decided to go back to the Fallout franchise once Skyrim DLC was completed, and they would do so with a few different games. Unfortunately, these games would finally tarnish their reputation in a way that stuck. The first to release was 2015's Fallout Shelter, a free-to-play mobile game where you managed your own vault. It scored a disappointing 71 on Metacritic due to its lack of depth, use of time-saving microtransactions, and was ultimately a game no one really wanted from such a prestigious single-player focused RPG developer, and then came Fallout 4. Despite numerous leaks beforehand, Todd Howard finally showed off Fallout 4 at E3 2015 with an extensive demo that introduced new features like managing settlements and a crafting system. It released just six months later, and to be fair, received a commendable 84 Metacritic getting the usual praise on player freedom, as well as the usual criticism on tech issues. It also sold more copies than Skyrim in the first year. Yet Fallout 4 would win very few awards due to The Witcher 3, which came out six months earlier and completely outclassed it with its gameplay, story, amount of content, graphics, and far fewer technical issues. And this was done by a developer with far less resources and CD Projekt Red. It's one thing to launch a great RPG with technical issues like before, but now that they were also being outmatched by competitors in the same genre, BGS really had to step it up for their next game to prove that they hadn't been left behind. And well, I guess it's time to discuss Fallout 76.
Fallout 76 released in 2018 and easily did the most reputational damage to not only Bethesda Game Studios, but Bethesda as a whole. In regards to the actual game, this was because Fallout 76 was an online only multiplayer experience, which apparently meant there was no need for the NPCs they had implemented so successfully in prior games. What was left was a husk of an open world that lacked competent game design, but still had the developers trademark tech issues. This resulted in BGS's worst Metacritic of 49, with sites like Giant Bomb and PC World ending reviews early because staff didn't want to waste their time with such a purposeless slash broken game that sold significantly less than Skyrim and Fallout 4. And as embarrassing as the game was at launch, their reputation only got worse due to the several unnecessary mistakes made afterwards. Here's just a few. Fallout 76's special edition was advertised to include a canvas duffel bag, but a cheaper nylon one was used instead. In response, Bethesda claimed this was due to unavailability of materials and that they wouldn't do anything about it despite not notifying pre-order customers before the game's launch. Then once the new story started gaining traction, Bethesda offered the equivalent of $5 in Fallout 76 currency, which wasn't even enough to buy the canvas bag in the game. And then it was discovered that Bethesda had actually made canvas bags and gave them to influencers for free. So after all this embarrassing press, Bethesda finally did the right thing and posted canvas bags six months later. There was also the inclusion of cosmetic items that cost nearly as much as Fallout 4 season pass, microtransactions that provided gameplay advantages despite assurances that this would never happen, and the ability to play on a private server through their $13 a month subscription, which was a feature heavily requested to be included with the base game when it was announced 18 months earlier. I could go on about former employees blaming senior staff for ignoring their game design concerns, or how developers like Arcane had to divert resources from Redfall just to get Fallout 76 to ship, but well, you get the point. And to be fair, BGS has somewhat turned Fallout 76 into a respectable game, especially with the 2020 Wastelanders update that introduced NPCs, but the reputational damage was done. Finally, I just want to briefly mention their most recent game, a free-to-play Elder Scrolls RPG that had a year of early access on iOS and still released to a new low of 42. It's already clear just how far the dev has fallen though, so let's look to the future. The only way out is death. The path ahead may be dangerous, but we are not stopping. Most Dusties don't even make it this far, because whatever lies at the end of this road will change humanity. Forever. The footage you just saw is from Starfield, Bethesda Game Studios' upcoming space-themed RPG that was announced at E3 2018 and will be their first new IP in over two decades. Starfield was then shown off again at E3 2021 and given a November 22 release date, before being delayed to sometime before July 2023. This was a massive blow to Xbox, as it was meant to be their marquee 2022 exclusive. But considering the reputational damage BGS has taken with their past four games, Starfield needs to hit Skyrim levels of critical and commercial success for the studio to remain relevant, and they know this. And this was before they were acquired by Microsoft, which has added the extra pressure of needing to be a system seller that convinces many potential PS5 owners to switch to Xbox. As someone who was blown away by Fallout 3 back in 2008, I hope they can once again reinvent the open world RPG shooter. But considering the last seven years, it's hard to be confident no matter how many delays Phil Spencer grants them. It's also worth mentioning that Elder Scrolls 6 was announced in 2018 and Todd Howard told IGN that Fallout 5 would come after. It makes a good headline, but let's be real here. Elder Scrolls 6 is coming in 2027 at the earliest. According to Howard himself, it's still in pre-production four years after announcement because it's all hands on deck for Starfield. And considering Starfield's success or failure will solidify how the industry looks at BGS going forward, let's get past that release before contemplating what their games could look like in five plus years. They've already proven in the past seven just how tarnished a reputation can become. Besides, when it comes to Fallout, right now, I'd rather see a new Vegas 2 from the consistently great Obsidian than a new mainline entry from Todd Howard anyways.